This video is a review of Dynamics for AP Physics 1. If you remember, Dynamics is the study of what actually causes objects to move. In order to get an object moving, let's say an object starts off at rest, then in order to get it moving, I have to increase its speed. I have to give it some speed. Therefore, by definition, the object needs to accelerate. And in order to get an object to accelerate, a force needs to be applied. There's a relationship between the forces that are applied to an object, its acceleration, and the mass of an object that's given by Newton's second law of motion. And that equation is written below. And we can see that if the net force applied to an object increases, then the acceleration will also increase. And for a given amount of force, if the mass of an object increases, then the acceleration would decrease. And the reason why we write net force in this equation is because there could be one force or many forces that act on an object. Also, because force is a vector, meaning that it has a not only a magnitude, but a direction, acceleration also is a vector. And so there are arrows written above the acceleration and force variables in this equation. Forces are measured in newtons, and mass is measured in kilograms. And of course, acceleration is measured in meters per second squared. And one thing that's key here is even though there might be multiple forces acting on an object, in order for the object to accelerate, the forces must be unbalanced. What I mean by that is, it's possible for a couple of forces or many forces to be acting on an object and for the object to have balanced forces. It's only when those forces are unbalanced that an acceleration is produced. Or it's only when there is a force applied to an object that doesn't have an opposing force that keeps the object at rest that we're able to get it to accelerate. The second point that I have here is that if the net force is zero, either due to no forces acting on an object or due to a couple of forces that are acting on an object that, that balance or cancel each other out, the object does not accelerate. Instead of accelerating, it will, if it was already at rest, remain at rest or continue to move at a constant speed. And this is an expression of Newton's second law or excuse me, Newton's first law of motion. And the most important point there is to make sure that you remember that if the forces are balanced, that it's perfectly fine for an object to continue moving at a constant speed. So long as an object is moving originally, then if the net force on that object is zero, it's fine for it to keep continuing uh, to move in a straight line at a constant speed. When we talk about forces, there are a lot of different types of forces that we've, we've mentioned. We've talked about normal force, applied forces, tension forces, gravitational forces, frictional forces, forces that are contact forces between two different objects, electric forces. And one thing that we eventually learned when we talked about the electric force later in the school year is that a lot of these forces are actually macroscopic interpretations of the electric force. So for example, the normal force is a force that's produced when one object is in contact with another. So if I place a box on a table, the table pushes up on the box, and we call that a normal force. But really that normal force is a macroscopic interpretation of each one of the little individual electric forces that's present between the electrons of the box and the electrons of the table. They have the same charge and we're trying to push those two objects to uh, closer toward one another because of their weight. And so there's, there's an upwards force that's caused there due to the repulsion between all the electrons and the atoms of those two objects. And the same thing um, could be um, used to understand things like a tension force or even an applied force where I take my hand and I push on an object and it's the same thing that the contact between my hand and that other object there's electric uh, repulsion that's happening there on the atomic level but nonetheless when we understand a problem um, 
with large scale objects with blocks and pulleys and things like that, then it's better for us to think about things like normal force, tension force, gravitational force. And these forces are vectors. And so the way that we represented these forces in a diagram, or a free body diagram, is by drawing arrows which indicate the direction and sometimes the magnitude. So sometimes the length of the arrow that I draw is important for understanding how big the force is. And so for example, on the bottom left hand uh, part of the screen I have a picture and this is an Atwood machine. There's a pulley and on either side of the pulley there's a box hanging there. And maybe each one of those boxes has a different amount of weight and I can draw a downward arrow that indicates the weight vector and I could represent that maybe with a capital letter W maybe with an F and a subscript G for the gravitational force I can also represent it with just M times G the weight and the other block might have the same amount of weight or a different amount of weight but it does have a weight and that weight vector points downward and if they were different blocks, so the two blocks did have different amounts of mass, then we might have to label those M1G and M2G. It's important that if objects have different masses that we label those masses differently and we account for those masses uh, as different masses in our equations. Now, if there were only downward forces being exerted on either one of those objects, then they would just fall to the ground. But of course, maybe in a system like this, they'd either be slowly accelerating toward the heavier object, or maybe they'd just be at rest. But either way, there has to be some upward force that's um, also being exerted on these objects. And that's going to be a tension force. So they're, they're being held up by a string, and so there's a tension force that's pulling up on either one of those objects. While the weight of those blocks might be different, the tension force that pulls up on either one of those blocks would be the exact same, and that's because the tension everywhere in the string that connects those two objects is exactly the same, and so the tension is the same. Looking at the picture that I have drawn on the right hand side, maybe this is a block that's sitting on a table, and the other block is hanging over a pulley and maybe there's friction between the block that's on the table and the table that it's on. And so for the hanging mass, it has some weight, mg, that points downward, and it has some tension force that points upwards, the same kinds of forces that were present in the system on the left. For the block on the table, the tension force pulls to the right, and again it's that same tension force because everywhere along that string the tension must be the same. For the block on the table, it also has a weight vector that points down, that gravitational force. There is a contact force between the block and the table that points upwards, which we call a normal force, and might label with a capital letter N. And lastly, I said that there was friction between um, the block and the table. And suppose that this block on the table would be sliding to the right, then that frictional force would always oppose the direction of the motion and would point to the left. And we often label frictional forces with a lowercase letter f. You might remember that sometimes we labeled other things in diagrams like this that indicated things like the acceleration. So for example, if in the picture on the right, the mass M2 was greater than the mass M1, then the objects, the pulley would rotate counterclockwise, the object on the right would accelerate downward, and the object on the left would accelerate upwards. But accelerations are not forces, and so those accelerations would never be included in a free body diagram. Similarly, um, I could have an acceleration vector pointing to the right for the table for the block on the table on the right hand system. Most of the time we are not drawing free body diagrams like this on the AP Physics exam. Typically we're just given a dot and we need to know that every force that is exerted on an object which is going to be represented by that dot needs to be an arrow that starts on the dot and points away from the dot. Make sure that there's no space between the arrow you draw and the dot
and make sure that every force vector that you label on that dot has a label so not just the arrow but some sort of letter that is appropriate and relevant for that force one of the most common examples of a free body diagram or one of the most common systems where we have to analyze it with forces dynamically is uh, an object that's rest at rest on an inclined plane or sliding down an inclined plane and because of the inclined nature of the plane some of these forces are going to be pointing in one direction and some of these forces are going to be pointing in another direction and this illustrates well that when we write force equations they must be constructed in a single direction in the same way that when I write a kinematic equation the equation can only be written for the x direction or the y direction not both I can only write force equations for the x direction or the y direction so for example when I write Newton's second law I really should be writing this as um, fx the sum of the forces in the x direction equals mass times the acceleration in the x direction or I could write similarly that the sum of the forces in the y direction is equal to the mass times the acceleration in the y direction and so one thing that's important to do is to make sure that I define the plus and minus directions in my system by adding a coordinate system so maybe for the the inclined plane that I've drawn it makes sense to make the positive y direction be perpendicular to the inclined plane and the positive x direction to be down the inclined plane and so let's suppose that this object when released from rest would accelerate down the inclined plane like this what I'd like to do is I'd like to write Newton's second law for both the x direction and the y direction and in order to do this we need to make sure that we not only draw all of the forces that are acting on the box but we also need to know or make sure that each one of those forces points in the y direction or the x direction and so let's take a look at this there's a force that points um, up from the surface away from the surface and perpendicular to the surface which is the normal force it's always perpendicular to the surface maybe there's some friction between the inclined plane and this object and maybe that force points up the plane because the object would be sl wanting to slide down the plane and so the static frictional force if it's at rest or the kinetic frictional force if it's accelerating down the ramp would point up the ramp this object also has some weight and the weight vector always points directly downward and I think that these are the three forces that act on the object and one of the problems that we run into is the normal force points in the positive y direction the frictional force points in the negative x direction and so those are fine but the weight vector points straight down and due to the fact that I rotated my coordinate system to match the inclined plane the weight vector does not point along one of the directions of the coordinate system and so we say we have to take that that force vector and break the force down into the x and y components so that way those components could be included in the equation and the way we do that for an inclined plane which at this point if you don't know already should just be something that you memorize is that this mg vector could be broken down into a triangle that looks like this a component that green line represents that is perpendicular to the inclined plane and points down and a component that is parallel to the inclined plane and points down the inclined plane like that the component that is perpendicular to the inclined plane is equal to mg cosine theta and the component that is parallel to the plane is equal to mg sine theta and that's because in this corner of the triangle that angle 
is exactly equal to the angle of the inclined plane theta. And so theta can be used to relate um, you know, the sides of this triangle. And so now what I'd like to do is take all of these forces and use them to write my Newton's second law equations. So down below, the net force in the x direction would be equal to mg sine theta, which is a positive force because it points in the positive x direction, minus f, which points up the ramp or in the minus x direction, is equal to m, the mass of this object, times the acceleration. And because the acceleration points down the ramp, the acceleration is also positive. But there's many cases where instead of writing a positive a, we'd write a negative a in parentheses. For the y direction, the normal force is a positive force that points in the positive y direction away from the ramp, minus the component of the gravitational force that points perpendicular and away from the ramp down in the minus y direction, mg cosine theta. And because the object is not accelerating up or down in the y direction, the right hand side of this equation is equal to zero. And so many times there are AP questions that ask for the form of these equations, which basically means um, you know, th these equations that we just wrote would probably be like the answers to the multiple choice question. Or sometimes we need to write these force equations in order to solve for a variable. Either way, it's extremely important that we're able to take systems like this inclined plane or other systems, identify all of the forces, and then write these equations. One last point that I want to make about free body diagrams is that sometimes on AP exams, the following kind of directions have been given. Draw the forces um, where the arrows start not on a point or a dot that's been provided to you, but at the physical location where the forces are actually applied. I have somewhat done this in this picture, but I've not done it perfectly. If I wanted to follow those directions perfectly, my arrows would look something like this. If I wanted to draw the arrows starting at the location where the force is actually applied, the normal force would be starting at the contact point between the block and the surface. The frictional force would be at the contact point between the block and the surface. But the one arrow that I didn't uh, do that correctly for would be the gravitational force vector. And that's because the gravitational force, the weight of that object, which points directly down, is a force that is exerted or can be said to be exerted at the center of mass of the object. And so at the center of mass of the object is where that gravitational force vector is really um, acting, at least in the assumptions that we're making. And so most of the time we get a dot where we draw all of those force vectors, but sometimes they ask us to draw the force vectors as they actually occur from the location where those forces are actually happening among the objects in a system. Another force that we studied in detail was the frictional force. And that's because there's a couple different kinds of friction and um, different problems use one or both kinds of friction. And so we need to make sure that we know the differences between the two and how we work with friction in a problem. This graph is really important for understanding how friction works. So first of all, in order to understand that graph, we need to know that there's two kinds of friction. The first kind of friction is static friction, which occurs when an object is at rest. And the way that that's represented in the graph is on the vertical axis, I'm plotting the frictional force. And on the horizontal axis, I'm plotting the applied force. So what I'm telling you is I'm going to apply a force to an object, and I want a graph of the frictional force exerted on that object versus the applied force. And what you would notice about this graph is as you start to apply a force, capital letter F, the frictional force that's applied to that object um, that goes in the opposite direction is 
equal and opposite to the force that you're applying. And that keeps happening, so you push harder and harder and harder on an object, and it doesn't move. And in order for the object not to be moving, something has to be canceling. It's that applied force and that frictional force. And so as you push harder and harder on the object, it will continue to not move until you get to a critical point. At that point, that blue dot that I've labeled, there is the maximum amount of static friction that can be present before the object starts to move. So sometimes this is labeled as the point of maximum static friction. Sometimes the phrase um, that it is about to slide, which is an important phrase, it's about to slide, is used to describe this point. Also, there is a coefficient of static friction that is used to describe that point, which we call mu s or mu s max, which stands for the coefficient of static friction. And if you wanted to calculate um, how much friction was present at that point, at the very top, that peak, that maximum static friction, then you could use the coefficient of static friction and the normal force to calculate that frictional force. In general, the equation for friction is F equals mu times N, where mu is the coefficient and N is the normal force. But one thing that we have to be very careful of for static friction is that it's possible for the amount of uh, the frictional force to be less than that maximum amount we would calculate at that peak. For example, if I apply a force of one newton to a box and it doesn't move, then the force of friction is one newton. If I apply a force of two newtons to that box and it doesn't move, the force of friction is two newtons. And I don't know yet whether or not I've applied the maximum amount of static friction. And so that, st that coefficient of static friction only applies to that one point. Otherwise, an object that's not about to slide, we, we can figure out how much friction there is just based on the applied force that's given. Once you go beyond that, that maximum point, beyond the point where the static friction can prevent the object from moving, the object enters a region of kinetic friction, which is on the right-hand side here. We'll call this the region of kinetic friction, where the other region was the region of static friction. Static meaning it's not moving, kinetic meaning it is moving. And in the region of kinetic friction, everywhere it has the same constant value. Hopefully you can notice by looking at this graph that regardless of the force that I apply, these green dashes, the frictional force is the same value everywhere along this horizontal line. And what that means is, regardless of the force that I apply, once an object starts to slide, the frictional force will have a constant value no matter what. And that constant value is associated with a uh, coefficient of kinetic friction, which is different than and less than the coefficient of static friction. And hopefully you can see that because the graph uh, dips down, that the coefficient of kinetic friction is less. And so what this means is that if I wanted to calculate the amount of friction present while an object is sliding, the applied force doesn't really help me with that, but I can use the coefficient of kinetic friction and the normal force to still calculate what that is. And hopefully now that we've reviewed this a little bit, if you take a look at your equation sheet, you can start to appreciate why they write the equation in this way. They write the equation in this, in this way, which looks a little bit weird, um, for the following reason. First, instead of a lowercase f, they write the frictional force as f subscript f. And instead of the normal force being just a capital N, they write the normal force as F subscript N. The coefficient of friction looks the same, but instead of an equal sign, they write less than or equal to. And the reason why it's less than or equal to is for the, reason that, for the reasons that I described in the graph. If I apply a force that's less than the maximum amount of static friction, then the frictional force can be less than that, that static friction coefficient times a normal force. It would be equal to the applied force and can take on any value that it wants to. 
But if I use the coefficient of kinetic friction for the coefficient and I plug in the normal force, then the frictional force would be exactly equal to that. And the same thing is true at the maximum amount of static friction point where I would use the coefficient of static friction and the normal force. In general, I just want you to remember that you can calculate friction by multiplying the coefficients that are given by the normal force. Most of the time, the normal force is just equal to the weight of the object if it's on a flat surface. But sometimes, like on an inclined plane, that normal force is not equal to the weight. It's only equal to a component of the weight. If you go back to the inclined plane diagram, you'll see that actually the normal force on an inclined plane is equal to mg cosine theta. It's not equal to just mg. So please remember there's two kinds of static friction. Remember the simple version of the equation for these uh, amounts of friction. And remember what this graph looks like to hopefully help you remember the differences between static and kinetic friction. Lastly, a couple of things that I want you to remember is first, we didn't talk about Newton's third law yet which states that for every force there's an equal and opposite force or action-reaction forces or action-reaction pairs of forces. And we should think about what those are. If I am uh, a moon next to a planet, they attract each other gravitationally. If I'm a proton and electron, they attract each other electrostatically by the Coulomb force. And so between two pairs of masses, there's gravitational forces that are equal and opposite that are exerted on one another. Between two charges, there are electric forces that are equal and opposite that are exerted on one another. And we would find the same thing if we look at our free body diagrams that include things like normal forces and tension forces. For every force, there's an equal and opposite force. If I push on a wall, the wall pushes back on me. And one of the things that Newton's third law taught us is that it, asked, it, be, it made us ask questions like, why do objects ever move? If every time there's a reaction that is equal and opposite to the action that I apply, why do objects ever move? How come when I push on a door, the door moves despite it applying an equal force back on me? And the answer to that question was exactly uh, in the words of my last sentence. I, I, I would apply a force to the door and the door applies a force to me. Because the door is on hinges, when I push on the door, the door is free to move. And because there's frictional forces between my shoes and the floor, when the door applies that same force to me, I don't necessarily go moving. And so we need to remember that there's always an, an equal and opposite force for every action that's applied, but that those forces might be applied on separate objects. And for those reasons, objects are able to move despite all of these equal and opposite forces. The second bullet point, a force I haven't talked about yet, is the force uh, that's present in Hooke's Law. So if I have a spring and I attach a mass to a spring, it stretches by a certain distance, the weight of that object applies a force to the spring and the spring applies a force on the weight. And we can t say, figure out how strong that force is um, by relating it to the spring constant and the stretch distance. So if I attach a mass to a spring and it stretches a certain distance x, and I know the weight of that object, then I know the force is caused by the weight, and I could measure the stretch distance and use those things to calculate the spring constant. You might remember a lab in which we made a graph of force versus stretch distance in order to calculate a spring constant. And in each case, the force that we measured uh, was the weight of the object, and then we measured the stretch distance with a ruler, and we were able to calculate the spring constant, which was in newtons per meter. I also want you to appreciate the fact that kinematic equations are often used in conjunction with dynamics problems. So using F equals MA and kinematic equations in the same problem. And that's because they both include acceleration. And so sometimes you will use a kinematic equation to solve for an acceleration that will be used in F equals MA, or sometimes you'll use F equals MA, a free body diagram, to solve for an acceleration that can be used in a kinematic equation. Lastly, if Newton's second law can be written as F equals MA, 
then it could also be re written as f equals m times delta v over delta t because an acceleration is by definition a change in velocity. And so if you are given velocities and times, it might be possible to relate Newton's second law using delta v over delta t instead of uh, just thinking about it as an acceleration.